in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. The death of Christ is commonly viewed in the present day within a substitutional context. The theological term commonly used is that of a vicarious substitution. What this means is that Jesus Christ, in dying on behalf of sinners, actually died in their place as their substitute. The vicarious substitution serves to satisfy or placate God, whereby he can then treat sinners as if they were innocent. God is satisfied, so to speak, by the substitution which serves as a counterbalance to sins being remitted. Without the satisfying counterbalance, sin simply could not be remitted, according to this line of thinking. In summary, there are three specific substitution views taught today. Satisfaction, penal substitution, and governmental. Satisfaction teaches that mankind's sin is an ultimate insult to the infinite holiness of God, and thus an affront to God's honour. In order to balance out the injustice of sin, a counterbalance of infinite value would be necessary if mercy were to be extended. Therefore, God incarnated as a human being who lived a blameless life and then offered himself to the Father as the necessary offsetting sacrifice of infinite value. God thus being satisfied can then justly remit sin while at the same time upholding his honour. Penal substitution teaches that God's justice demands that sin be punished. God therefore, incarnated as a human being, lived the perfect life and offered himself up as a substitute for the sinner. Jesus willingly took upon himself the guilt of sinners and thus bore upon himself the full wrath of God. The sin debt having been paid for by Jesus Christ therefore satisfies the demand for justice. Also, with the debt having been paid, it cannot be held due again. The governmental view teaches that in order for God to freely forgive sin without undermining divine justice, there must be a substitute for the punishment of sin. The punishment of sin serves to uphold justice by placing value upon God's law. The sacrifice of Jesus serves as a substitute for the punishment, which demonstrates that God indeed takes his law seriously. Thus God can justly forgive sin without undermining his moral government. The fundamental flaw with these substitutional theories is that satisfaction, penal substitution and the governmental view all shift the mind away from the purging and purifying of which the Bible speaks by associating the cross with the notion of a cosmic transaction. In the book of Hebrews chapter 9 we read the following How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is only of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. The Bible very clearly teaches that Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament for the cause of purging the conscience from dead works that one may serve the living God. The Bible teaches that the fundamental problem between a sinner and God is not the need for some kind of satisfaction, but that the fundamental problem is rather an issue of the heart and conscience. The Bible specifically teaches that Jesus died to deal with the issue of the heart and conscience. This purging of the conscience takes place by the means of the new covenant which Jesus established with his blood. It is through the new covenant that an individual is wholly set apart from their past dead life and brought into a new life of union with God. With the law having been written upon the heart and into the mind, this law being the law of love. In Hebrews 10.16 we read, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. The Bible presents the cross in the context of a covenant, not in the context of a substitution. The cross, as presented in Scripture, is something that one actually partakes in, as opposed to being something that one merely trusts in. When Jesus spoke of his death to his disciples, 
he presented it in the context of being an example to follow. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Not a single time did Jesus ever present his death as being any kind of substitute that was necessary in order to satisfy justice. If Jesus did not teach substitution, then ought we teach substitution? Isaiah 53.11 says, He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. The reason God was satisfied with the travail of the soul of Jesus was not because Jesus was a substitute for justice, but rather because it would be through the knowledge of Jesus that many would be justified. The knowledge of Jesus is the knowledge of the true righteousness of God, the knowledge of love, which is shed abroad in the heart under the new covenant. Now, as it pertains to the bearing of iniquity or the bearing of sin, Jesus didn't bear our iniquities in any greater sense than the scapegoat literally had the iniquities of the people placed upon it. In Leviticus chapter 16, verses 21 and 22, we read, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness." The goat bore the iniquities of the people in the sense that the goat was the means by which the people were able to put away the burden of their past in order to move on with the future. It is the same with Jesus in which a sinner is able to put their past life upon him where it is put away through his death, whereby the burden of condemnation is put away also, knowing that God has granted forgiveness through the blood. Ephesians 1.7 Thus the burden of the past is lifted in order that we may serve in good conscience in the future. A fresh start granted by God's grace. It is only by the pure mercy of God through which we may be cleansed of our past sins. God has chosen to grant us this favour through the cross of Jesus Christ and thus truly gives us the opportunity of a fresh start in which we may serve him in spirit and truth with the law written upon our hearts and in our minds. When Isaiah wrote, All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned every one to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53 verse 6 the context is that of a deliverance from being led astray and turning to our own way. In other words, God laid upon Jesus the burden of deliverance. In understanding this concept, the bearing of our sins by Jesus becomes very clear. Try to view the bearing of iniquity in the context of a burden to deliver. Through rebellion, human beings have placed themselves into a state of spiritual darkness in which they know not God. Sinners thus walk their own way according to the lusts of the flesh and the vanity of the mind in bondage to sin, condemnation, and death. Now Jesus bears this rebellion through his sacrifice, for he died on our behalf to deliver us from the wretched state we sold ourselves into. The deliverance is wrought through the knowledge of him. Isaiah 53.11 Jesus did not bear our iniquity in the context of a literal transfer of iniquity, where he somehow assumes our guilt as a substitute for us. Rather, he bears our iniquity in the sense of doing something for us, through which we can then escape bondage. Jesus not only bore our sins, he also bore our griefs, carried our sorrows, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. The context is not a literal transfer of sin, griefs, or sorrows. The context of bearing sin is that of a sin offering through which we may find a clear conscience, in that we have put our past life of serving sin upon Jesus, where it is counted dead, 
and in being raised up to the newness of life through the Spirit, by which the knowledge of God is made manifest to us, the result being that we come into a direct relationship with God. Jesus, in bearing our griefs and sorrows, provides us with an example in order to encourage us. The emotions of grief and sorrow cannot literally be transferred from one person to another any more than sin can. Please consider these ideas in spite of the common teaching that pervades Christian orthodoxy. If sin can be literally transferred, as many believe, then so can sorrow and grief. In order to believe in a literal transfer of sin, one must throw reason to the wind. The idea of a literal transfer of sin is rooted in the theology of substitution, not in the Bible. Sin itself is not a transferable property. It is moral. Sin is principled upon choice and action, both sins of ignorance and sins of intent. Sin cannot literally be transferred from one individual to another. The reason God was satisfied with the travail of the soul of Jesus was not because Jesus was a substitute for justice, but rather because it will be through the knowledge of Jesus that many would be justified. The knowledge of Jesus is the knowledge of the true righteousness of God, the knowledge of love, which is shed abroad in the heart under the new covenant. Paul wrote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The means to know the will of God is through the means of presenting ourselves as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service. We are not to be conformed to this world, but rather to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Peter wrote of the mind in saying, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 We are to arm ourselves with the same mind of Jesus Christ, whom suffered for us in the flesh. By doing so, we no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lusts of men. Instead, we live to the will of God. Thus, it makes sense that Jesus would say, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life, shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake, shall find it. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. We are to lose our old life, that we may partake in the new life found in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Galatians chapter 6, verses 14 to 16. Paul identified with the cross of Jesus Christ as being a manifest experience. He was dead to the world, and the world was dead to him via the means of the cross. In other words, Paul partook of the cross with Jesus Christ. Peter described it like this, For Christ, although hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Who was in prison? The servants or slaves of sin, of course. Jesus testified to those in bondage by the means of the cross, and thus he suffered for the sins of those in bondage in order that they be set free from those sins. There is no substitution involved. What is involved is a covenant and a rescue. God was long-suffering during the time that Noah was building the ark. In continuing to read from 1 Peter chapter 3, we read, Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Noah was saved by the means of having a good conscience toward God, in that he yielded to God's instructions in building the ark. This is typified by the expression of water baptism, which is a representative of death and rebirth, death of the old life and rebirth into the new, in which a good conscience toward God is manifest. The same is also typified by the cross, a death of the old life 
and a resurrection into the new, whereby, we keep reading in Peter, who is gone into heaven, and it is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Can you see the flow of Peter's thoughts? Let's continue. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. That's in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 25. The death of Christ has nothing to do with any kind of substitution which somehow brings balance to uphold God's honor, or a balance for the necessity of punishment, or a balance for upholding God's government. Rather, the death of Christ has everything to do with the purging and purifying the souls of individuals, whereby being dead to sin and living for righteousness, they can experience a union with God. That's what it means, being now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Paul writes in Colossians, Who is the image of the invisible God, speaking of Jesus Christ, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister." So that's in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Jesus taught that there is no greater love than when a man lays down his life for his friends. Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's in John chapter 15, verses 12 and 13. Jesus, in laying down his life on behalf of mankind, established the new covenant firmly upon the principle of true righteousness. Jesus not only bore witness and testified of the righteousness of God through his life and death, but he also testified of the power of God through his resurrection. In humbling himself in the fashion of a man, by becoming obedient unto death, Jesus has been highly exalted by the Father, and the righteousness of God has been manifested in all its fullness to humanity. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, we read, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In John chapter 1, verses 14 to 18, we read, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. 
It was Jesus Christ whom brought the knowledge of God in all its fullness to the world, and it is through this knowledge that the ungodly may find justification. In Isaiah 53.11, we read again, He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapters 1, 1-3, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Confirm your calling and election, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. The knowledge of him is not merely knowing about Jesus, but in actually partaking of him, an experiential knowing. In John chapter 6, verses 53 to 58, we read, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent before me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live for ever. In Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 we read, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. In Leviticus we read that life is in the blood, and that the Israelites were forbidden to eat the blood of dead animals. Under the new covenant we are to eat the flesh of Jesus and drink his blood. This being symbolic of partaking and abiding in his substance. Or in other words, the spirit of his life, as it says in Romans chapter 8 verse 2. The new covenant was established by the blood of Jesus, symbolically teaching that the new covenant is established upon the principle of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. Hence, the new covenant is one of the spirit and not of the letter. You can read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6. Physical life being found in physical blood is an illustration of spiritual life being found in the spirit. It is in the spirit that we find no condemnation because the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us not a righteousness of the letter, rather a righteousness of the Spirit. Now pay attention to these four verses and see if you can get the thoughts of Paul here. This is Romans chapter 8 verses 1 to 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. See, it's through the Spirit that we find life and peace, a true union with God. In Romans 8, 6 we read, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The reason we have life and peace through being spiritually minded is because our conscience has been purged of dead works because all our works are made alive to God through the Spirit. So again, now connect what we just read to what it says in Hebrews chapter 9 again. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, for a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Can you see how the substitution message utterly destroys the simplicity of the gospel by shifting the mind away from manifestly partaking in Christ in reality to partaking in Christ in position? Under substitution, salvation is always positional as opposed to being something manifest. 
It has to be because the fundamental principle of reconciliation is one of Jesus making satisfaction via means of being a substitute, which people then trust is real. Under the covenant model, absent substitution, the fundamental principle of reconciliation is the purging and purification wrought through entering into covenant via a death and rebirth in which the inward character, the condition of the heart, has been totally changed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 we read, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We are literally made the righteousness of God in him, not in position, but in reality. Under substitution, the cross is an abstract concept pertaining to some cosmic adjustment. In the Bible, the cross is a present reality partaken in with Christ. It's a huge difference. Substitution is the most insidious and dangerous doctrine to ever rise up in professing Christianity. It utterly destroys the concept of the death of the old man in repentance. Without the old man dying, the new man cannot be born. It is that simple. And that's why this doctrine is so dangerous. It doesn't matter whether you're a Catholic or an adherent of moral government theology, Arminian theology or Reformed theology. They are all under the sway of substitution. They all contend for salvation that is an abstract concept as opposed to it being a manifest state. Even when obedience is mandated as a required condition in order to receive the provision of substitution, it is still fallacious because the death of Christ is still disconnected from the purging of the conscience. A purging which can only occur through participation, not mere acknowledgement or trust. Justification and sanctification cannot be disconnected, yet they must be disconnected under substitution. Under substitution, justification is purely premised upon the satisfaction wrought by the substitute. In the gospel, justification is premised upon the transformation wrought via participation. The new covenant is like a marriage covenant. In approaching God, the sinner lays aside all filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness, and approaches God with a true heart, seeking a cleansing. It is in repentance that the old man is put to death, being the death of the old life of rebellion and self-service. The old life is therefore replaced by the new life, a wholly submitted heart towards God, the root of iniquity having been thoroughly purged, the individual therefore entering faithfully into union with God through the new covenant as they are quickened by the Holy Spirit and thus raised to newness of life. It is within this context that the Bible strongly warns against willfully sinning after having come to a full knowledge of the truth. For to willfully sin after this takes place is to utterly despise the means that one was purged and purified, a despising of the means by which one escaped bondage and condemnation. To willfully sin from a state of having experienced a real salvation defiles the conscience to a much greater degree than the willful sin of someone whom has never escaped bondage in the first place. To tread underfoot the blood through which one was set free and made clean is to treat the grace of God as something very cheap. Due to the theology of substitution, very few people understand this warning because they do not associate the blood of Christ with its true purpose of redeeming sinners from all iniquity and bringing them into a pure state. In their minds, the blood is merely the means by which a substitutional satisfaction was achieved on their behalf. Can you see the disconnect? Can you see the danger of substitution as it applies to the cross of Jesus Christ? I hope so. There is no sin-repent cycle in the genuine salvation experience. Clean is clean, and pure is pure, and any ongoing unfaithfulness to God reveals a defiled heart, the only remedy being godly sorrow working a genuine repentance unto a genuine salvation, an experience which is not meant to be repeated. I urge those watching this video who are under any form of substitution theology, whether it be moral government, satisfaction, or penal substitution, to seriously examine what they believe as to whether it is truly biblical or not, then also examine as to whether they are truly in the faith or not. Has your heart been truly purged and purified? Paul warned the church of Ephesus, 
Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseas to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one day and night with tears. That's in Acts chapter 20, verses 26 to 31. Three years with tears. Paul warned that grievous wolves would enter in among the flock whom would speak perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Three years with tears. I have written a book which examines this subject in great detail. The book is a comprehensive refutation of the substitution lie on the basis of what the Bible actually teaches. The book also examines the historical development of substitution in order to provide the context of how this insidious teaching developed. The book is available free to download at the links in the description for this video. It is also for sale at near cost on both Lulu and the Amazon stores. If you are interested in a physical copy and do not wish to spend any money, then simply request one from me and I will be happy to purchase it and mail it to you. Thank you for watching.